We will convene the regular uh, council meeting uh, and again recognize that we meet on the traditional territory of the Latako Denny Nation. Uh, with respect to the approval of the agenda, I have no notification of late agenda items or uh, any additions. I don't believe so. I didn't get a note saying. Correct. The housing summary PowerPoint. It's an agenda item, but it's just this, the PowerPoint is going to be presented uh, when we get to that point. Okay. So with that, can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Councillor Elliott, so moved. Councillor Vic, second. Any questions or comments on the agenda? Seeing none, uh, then I would ask for a motion. And again, this is where, for those who don't remember, I have to turn my mic off before you vote. So uh, 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 a vote on approval of the agenda. No, the agenda. So this is, as soon as you see, oh, we're, we've lost our uh, screen here. So, because um, we, ha we have to be conscious of how it's being videoed. And if I don't turn my mic off, then the public doesn't see the vote. So that's what this issue Just is. Just a point of order, please. Yeah. Are, are we being actually recorded right now? Yeah. Oh, is the recording off? Good catch. Good catch. But we're just, we don't have our red light on. But as long as it's being recorded there, then we can address the red light issue, right? Oh, so there you go. Okay, so we're all learning. Okay, so now the vote for the approval of the agenda. All in favor, pause. Okay, any opposed, pause. Okay, so there we go. Uh, adoption of the regular minutes of uh, June 15th, motion to adopt. Councillor Rudenberg, so moved. Councillor Goulet, second. Any questions or comments on the minutes? All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, that motion has carried. And then we'll move into delegations, and Darren keeps popping on and off, so. Can you see me? <laughs> yeah. No, we can't see you, Darren. We can hear you, though. Okay. Um, I can see myself. We go. we've got, <laughs> yeah, we've got you now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Darren, the floor is yours. You know the drill, uh, and uh, you have your 15 minutes of fame. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and good evening, Council. Um, good to see you. Sorry I didn't make the trip up to Quinell tonight. It was, uh, it was just far too hot to get onto the motorcycle tonight and make the trip there, so... I decided to try and zoom in from here, um, but thank you for having me and I'll try and keep the, the presentation brief. Um, I know that uh, Rhea has circulated the information, uh, it's the, the background information that I've been using um, for these presentations. So I'd, I'd like to allow as much time for questions if, if possible, because I think that's where, uh, where the real information will come out. So, um, and I know we've touched on this briefly a couple of times at the, the North Caribou Joint Advisory Committee. Um, but in summary, the regional district is, is looking at creating a new service. We're looking at creating a regional trails and park service. Um, it's something that's been in discussion at the regional district for, for a very long time. Um, initially, it was anecdotally uh, identified as a, a gap in our ability to provide services in, in recreation across the region. Um, and then and more serious of, of late. And, and I know this body is, is well aware that, uh, and I think we've come to an agreement that the time for trails has come as a recreation amenity. Um, we've made significant investments in them. The city of Cornell has actually been leading the way in, in lots of uh, those projects. Um, the rest of the region is following suit as well, um, whether you're aware of those other, uh, other activities or not, but it is, it is region-wide. Um, it's in municipalities, it's on the edges of municipalities, it's in rural areas. There are networks of, of all sites of activities, mountain bikes, walking, hiking, motorized, non-motorized, equestrian. And, and I think we were just in agreement that the, the time for investment in these types of recreation assets has come. So the challenge became for the regional district is, is we recognize that this was important, um, but we lacked the ability to be a full participant in it. So again, a, a, a short regional district 101 is that we're limited by where we provide services and where we don't. We have 
I think we're about 110 different services at this point. Each one of those services has a defined boundary to it. It has a taxation boundary. And where those taxes are collected, that's where that service is delivered. So the challenge with having a regional trail service is we didn't have a structure. We didn't have a mandate. We didn't have a budget to be involved in trails outside of some of our limited abilities within the sub-regional rec functions. You're all very familiar with North Caribou Recreation and Parks and the, the work around trails in that area, um, but that's limited for us. Uh, we have that similar setup around uh, the Greater Williams Lake area and around the South Caribou um, around 100 mile, but it doesn't give us the ability to make big, long regional connections for trails. It doesn't give us the ability to invest in trails that are outside of those areas where even though they might benefit fit everyone across the region and provide those even uh, advanced tourism benefits that we're starting to see now with some of these sub-regional recreation trails. So, you know, with, we're recognizing the need that this, uh, this desire to be more involved in trails was there. So we're finally taking that official step to try and establish a regional service. So, so the proposal for this service, and, and it's deliberately called a regional trails and parks service. M most other regional districts have them. Um, they often call them parks and trails services, and, and they do provide um, you know, some community parks. There's, there's very, very well-developed um, services through like the Central Okanagan Regional District. Many of the places in uh, through the Shushwap or in the Kootenays also have very, very developed regional district park services. We weren't aiming so much at parks. I, I think the feeling is we're fairly well served by rec sites and trails BC, the, the forest rec sites and by BC parks um, in that regard. But there was a real gap in our ability to be more involved in, in trail systems and particularly trail networks and long trails where we run into jurisdictional issues about you know who would be the primary investor and leader and, and um, project um, uh, creator and then also responsible for the maintenance of those those longer trails that cross jurisdictions. So it, we're taking these official steps now. What we've done is brought this information to the Committee of the Whole at the Regional District Board. It's gone to the Regional District Board. Um, we have got support from the board to reach out to the other partners. Um, the municipalities. So I've made this same presentation to the District of 100 Mile and Council in uh, Mayor and Council in the City of Williams Lake uh, here tonight. And then I still need to connect with the District of Wells. So, and the reason for that is the vision is a true regional function that we would have full participation from all electoral areas and and all um, municipalities in the region. And then we don't have boundaries. Um, you're familiar with some of our challenges with like the sub-regional rec boundary where there's a line and, and there are recreation investments and assets that are outside of that line that we would like to be working on, but we're limited again by how the regional district functions with our firewalls between budgets and service areas. So we didn't want to draw or we wanted as few boundaries as possible in this so we'd have the maximum amount of flexibility in projects we could become involved in and priorities we could set. Um, so we wanted to uh, approach those other municipalities we have. That's the updated front end of, of the memo. Um, unfortunately, the, the District of 100 Mile has declined to be a participant. They account for just over 4% of this uh, of the regional assessment. So again, that's how the regional district collects taxes and it's proposed for this one would be on the assessed values within one of those participating areas. So the District of 100 Mile uh, Council has passed their resolution to decline. Um, the City of Williams Lake uh, simply received the information and directed that staff um, get together and discuss some more details about, uh, about what this proposal might look like for the city, as well as some of, there's some uh, peripheral issues to our relationship with the City of Williams Lake that we're trying to sort through as well. So I think that one counts as a maybe at this point, um, but we're continuing on to see what other um, support we can get across the region. I think that um, I'll let the memo speak for itself around what the priorities are outlined there about, you know, looking at, at regional trails, looking at our wheelchair accessible wilderness trails network, engaging with nonprofit groups. And, and there's also the feeling this is a real opportunity to do better at engaging First Nations. Uh, we know that they have a very strong connection to the land and we've done many tr successful trail projects with First Nations as partners. And this just gives the ability to do more of that, both from a, a strategic concept uh, aspect, but also from an ongoing maintenance and, and construction um, concept as well. I think First Nations are getting a lot of capacity in that area and it's a natural fit for some economic activity for, um, for those partnerships. 
Um, so looking at what the initial priorities are and calculating that into an initial budget, the, the requisition I've proposed is $200,000, uh, which would be collected again across the maximum tax base possible. So the initial proposal is a, across the entire region. Um, and by doing this, I think we would need a regional trails coordinator. I think that's the other lesson we've learned, and we've learned it, you know, from the North Caribou Rec function. It is the only sub-regional rec function that has a trail coordinator. You've seen the presentations from from Ian Van Loosden, and and he set a fantastic example of of why that position can be so valuable. So um, I do see that uh, we would like to have that capacity across the entire region. Um, I have I've spoken with Ian about it. He actually asked the question: Does this mean that you know my my job will, would disappear under sub-regional rec uh, and be supplanted by this regional this regional position. And, and I definitely don't think so. I think there's more than enough projects and activities to go around. Um, the focus of the regional function can be elsewhere. Um, I see it more as a collaborative opportunity. Um, if anything, I think that it augments our ability to do more. Uh, I think Ian is busy enough that certainly we could uh, provide him more support. Uh, you know, he, he does he does do his trail coordinator role part time as it is. So certainly some more support, I think, would allow us to do even more. So the idea isn't to replace that position within the sub regional rec functions, but just to make sure that they're working collaboratively and avoid duplication and overlap between those. So so with the initial bu initial budget proposal of 200,000, the primary uh, cost for that would be a, a regional coordinator position. Um, and that's essentially an all in cost for their uh, their IT assets required and some minor operating budget, travel budget, essentially for them. And then looking at, uh, so that's about half of that, $100,000. And then looking at some of the other agreements, and I've, I've tried to highlight specifically some that I would see transferring from the sub-regional rec budget into a more appropriate regional budget. And so the primary one you'll be familiar with is the, uh, the maintenance agreement with the Gold Rush Cycling Club that was recently agreed to through the North Caribou. Um, you know, I think the assets that the Gold Rush Cycling Club looks after are, are truly regional assets. I think they draw, you know, as an example, draw a lot of tourism to the areas. They connect very well with other mountain bike networks in the region. Um, to me, that would be a good fit that the, that $15,000 would be allocated to this regional trails budget rather than a sub-regional rec budget. That's an example, doesn't necessarily have to be that way, but I was trying to provide examples of, of how we would um, try and avoid duplication of those types of items and, and again, recognize which, which assets belong within which budgets. Then there may be other smaller ones that um, still belong within sub-regional rec, the bike park, for example, perhaps behind the, the Arts and Rec Center that's going to be in construction soon. To me, that's a sub-regional rec asset more more so right so that those costs that project stays within sub-regional rec some of the bigger stuff that the the bike club is doing at dragon mountain potentially wonderland belongs in a regional function for examples um, and then i think you know going forward from there that uh, the the budget would essentially be driven by what the priorities are set by the regional district board and and the joint committees that participate in in the identification of where those next trail project priorities would be um, we'd have the ability to, again, I think trails are one of those opportunities where grant funding has proven to be readily available, and, and we would just have one more budget to be able to, to access for leveraged funding, depending on where those priorities were. So I think we would, we would look for um, budget growth after that to see where those project priorities could be. And then coming down to conclusion, and then we'll get to questions. Sorry if I start to ramble. I, I take a note from Mr. Norburn's book on occasion when I get warmed up. Um, they're looking at the tax rate. So if we were to spread these priorities and we spread that $200,000 across the entire region, it works out to about $1.65 per 100,000 of the assessed residential value. So that's the tax rate that we would be proposing to collect that $200,000 across the entire region. Works out to $1.65 per 100,000 of assessed residential value. So that number is still valid, even with, uh, I've recalculated even if the District of 100 Mile, which they have now chosen not to participate, because of rising assessed values, I can still collect that 200,000 around that $1.65 per 100. So that number is still valid. Um, at the back of the memo, I've also noted, so if the discussions with the city of Williams Lake don't 
prove uh, prove successful in the city of Williams Lake, which is a bigger piece of the tax base. They're a little over 15% of the regional tax base chooses not to participate. Then that changes the regional numbers to about $2 per 100,000. So at this stage, that's the number we would be dealing with. I'm not sure the regional district board would be interested in pursuing it if we don't get full participation. I think that'll be a future discussion to have. Um, I know there's a lot of support uh, of this concept from across the board table. Um, I think Mayor Simpson has participated in some of those board meetings where it has come up and we've we've had that discussion around the need for this and, and we're already have kind of one foot in this game already. We get involved in a lot of trail projects. We've done it through uh, economic development services in the past, um, which has been you know, it's been a reasonable approach, but it certainly has limited in our ability to really make a difference in in um, in growing the the regional trails that are available in um, across the Caribou. So, you know, I think those are what the numbers are, order of magnitude. What I need to do now is is see what the participation level is from municipal partners, and then go back to the regional district board and say, okay, this is the participation levels we have. These are what the numbers would look like and then decide how we would proceed from that point on. So, you know, at this stage, the number 165 per 100,000 is still valid. If the city of Williams Lake opts out, then that increases it slightly to about $2 per 100,000 for the rest of the region. Um, and then, you know, we'd have to decide uh, the ability to go forward from there. It, it does make it a challenge if you start to pull participating areas out because then you start to ask questions about why would we do this project here when that area isn't participating. It's a con common discussion we have at the regional district table. So so maybe I will leave it at that for now and then and maybe um, there's some questions that we could use to generate further discussion. Thank you, Director Norburn. You're a very bad influence. Uh, just <laughs> saying. Thanks, Darren. Was that, that was 15 good. minutes? I, it yeah, see, no, it just it's flies all good. by, doesn't uh, it? <laughs> it's all good. You covered all just... the highlights uh, uh, and uh, the key points that weren't in there about the taxation function, et cetera. So the floor is open uh, for Council to ask any questions or make any comments. Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I guess the first word I would use to describe this proposed uh, service is that it's not only reasonable, I think it's logical. We are in the trails business right now. We are we're developing new trails all the time. The onus is on us to maintain these assets and this is the vehicle to do that. So again, it's not only reasonable, I think it's logical. I think having a coordinator as part of that budgeted amount is smart. Um, to keep us focused and aware and taking advantage of opportunities, not only for mountain bikers, but for hikers, snowmobilers, the like. So I would certainly be in favor of this and uh, I hope we can move this along. And, and just for clarification for council and Darren's aware of this, this is a delegation, so we won't be making a decision. A staff report will come forward and that's our opportunity to take positions around this. Delegations, our normal function is to just ask questions for clarification and then it'll come back and we can deliberate it. Uh, Councillor Paul and then Councillor Goulet. Yeah, thank you, Darren. Um, Great, uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm I'm a big fan of, of trails. Uh, as you know, I'm involved with um, new pathways to gold and through that um, as a subset, uh, the Caribou Gold Rush Trail or Snowmobile Trail, which goes from I think 70 mile out to likely and eventually we hope that it'll eventually go over to, to Wells. And uh, my interest through my involvement with the Gold Rush Trail sled dog mail run is to get a dedicated trail from the greater Quinell area, I'm thinking Umidy Pit on the north side of the Cottonwood River, out to Wells, and it wouldn't only be a dog sled trail, but possibly a, a snowmobile trail, and, and there's even talk about the desire for a, a, a year-round trail for mountain biking and, and cross-country skiing and so on. So I, I'm, I'm pretty en enthusiastic about this idea. Um, certainly a, a coordinator uh, would be a big advantage as far as um, trying to find some dedicated trail for the for the dog sled mail run. And um, I really do hope that uh, that Williams Lake uh, will decide to get on board because I think it's uh, uh, well worth a dollar sixty five uh, taxes on on a hundred thousand. Councillor Goulet. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Darren, for the uh, presentation. And I'm going to echo uh, the previous two speakers about the coordinator. I think that's a that's a position that's needed in order to to move this forward. And I'm glad you spoke about the tax rate because it was a little confusing on the on on the tax rate. If 100 Mile and Williams Lake opt out, who is the other one to pay the two dollars for 100? Uh, assess value right so it's kind of uh, an interesting comps and i hope that they do come on with that that could be a concern as to who pays that that two dollars right so and i'm glad that they're having that conversation and you clarified that so thanks okay councillor runge then councillor rudenberg thank you very much uh darren great presentation and you know what I'm, it's exciting i i do have one question though and i'm not sure if you're able to share with us but i would you be able to share with us some of those reservations that 100 Mile or Williams Lake are having? You know, because to me, I just see this as a positive all around for the caribou. Is there something that we might be missing here? Yeah, I, I'm comfortable speaking to them. Like, and, and I think they were both generally supportive of trails. Like the, the reception was, was, was good at, at both locations. Um, the main concern from 100 Mile or most of the questions we had was about um, taking on a provincial responsibility. So rec sites and trails BC, as uh, Councillor Paul mentioned, the Gold Rush Snowmobile Trail. So that's already designated as a rec sites and trails BC. But the regional district doesn't have the ability to be a partner in such a project such as that, whether there's improvements to it or a more active role involved in it. So the, I think the District of 100 Miles reservations was around, well, isn't the province supposed to be doing these things? Why would we why would we be at the same table? So I, I think, you know, our thoughts on that was just, you know, the regional district doesn't have the ability to be there if we don't have this service in place. And, and I think, again, seem similar to the municipalities, we expect this to be a partnership with the province. There's in, by no means are we replacing the province. We wouldn't even want to try, but we do want to have, um, be able to encourage and develop more partnerships with the province to be able to, to do better at some of those long regional asterisks like the Gold Rush Snowmobile Trail, like the Dog Sled Trails, like the Caribou Wagon Road. I think the, the province and, you know, Desi Chevery and, and Curtis Offsey and, and Jamie Hills have done a good job, but they need help. They need help from the regional district level, I think, to be able for our region to truly, uh, to truly um, reach its potential for, for those types of trail assets. Um, and then for the for the city of Williams Lake, they had great great questions. Um, again, I think the it was uh, amicably received, but they did have some other questions. Not so much around trails, but some of the other assets that we share costs for. Um, so you know, in the North Caribou Rec function, we do have uh, a sharing of a certain basket of recreation services. It's a different basket in the Central Caribou. So there's some ongoing discussions about what we already have cost sharing on in recreation, and I think that's some clarification that they're looking for before making any final decisions on on this proposed regional service. Um, the other concern I think that was clear about the city from the city of Williams Lake was uh, they, like the city of Quinnell, has been doing a lot of trail work and they worried about competition, that if the regional district is, again, out searching for trail projects, it may diminish the city's ability to, uh, to do their own trail projects within the municipality. So those were the concerns. That, those were my take home concerns that the other locations raised. Um, and I think our, the, my response to it and message to them was, this is the regional district being better positioned to be a partner in these trail projects, both within the municipalities and across the region in areas where we would be leading them. So again, using Councillor Paul's example of that, you know, the Gold Rush uh, snowmobile trail or, or the dog sled trail, those are in areas where the local government is the regional district. So if there was a local government presence on those trails, whether it's in a leadership role to get it done or an ongoing maintenance contract role, you know, that's where the regional district is best positioned to take that role if this regional function is established. Okay, Councillor Rudenberg. Thanks. Good evening. Um, so um, I go back to your report and you use the term a moderate organic approach to long term development of regional trails and services. Yes, really? doesn't, that sound, doesn't that sound lovely? <laughs> so, you know, I'm trying, I was trying to figure out what the, what some of the concerns would be from the, from the Williams Lake area and 100 mile. And so do you think part of it is, is that um, um, they don't have a regional type of hub plan already? So they really don't have, especially 100 mile, like, do they not, do they have a plan 
that they've even thought about for trails. So if you don't have a kind of, a, you know, a background or a plan yourselves, kind of like what we have here in and around Quenelle, then why would you want to donate to something that you don't know what you're going to get back from, correct? So when you use the term organic, I, I think for me, I, I think you need to make sure that you come at it with a plan in place for each of these areas, because then they know exactly what is coming down. I don't think it creates um, confusion with stakeholders. I think it actually gives you the confidence that you know you're moving ahead with what's best for each region. So I'm kind of curious of how this one over encompassing position could take take such a large area and be able to to um, to provide what each of those areas need, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So how do yeah. you see that playing out? Because I just can't see one person being able to understand exactly what the Quinell area needs or what Williams Lake needs because they've got their established area, what 100 Mile might need because they're thinking about establishing something. How does one position do that? And and I think you're right. It, it's a, it would be a challenging position just given the, the size and breadth of the region. And, and I think what I meant by a moderate organic approach was that what I was really trying to avoid was a feasibility study of some kind to determine what the value in this. I was really hoping to, I think, you know, we've established the value of trails, you know, and even that's why I specifically listed items like the dog sled trails, like the snowmobile trails, because we know they're there and I think they're underserved. So I think, you know, as far as what would this person do if they started tomorrow, um, you know, that's listed in there, those those trail networks that we know, and they do exist. Um, 100 Mile has a developed snowmobile trail network, particularly in the Watch Lake, Green Lake area. They have some equestrian trails. They have a very active backcountry horseman group. Um, they have mountain bike trails throughout 99 miles, some at 108. We have a, a five, six low mobility trails. So I think, you know, the, the assets are there. And I think that it's a matter of improving them and connecting them and then following through with the, um, the priorities beyond that. Like I, I, I think I'm familiar with the, with the snowmobile trail in particular, as an example, I guess it's, you know, and I think it's a fantastic vision, but it's been challenged for its functionality because it's such a long trail. It's several hundred kilometers of trail. The maintenance on it is, is just such a beast. So, you know, even in years where you get good snow and, and if it makes it a multi-season and allows other kinds of use, um, the South Caribou group actually had a fat biker take it the trail this March, uh, you know, he, he took a fat bike, which are the bike with the big tires you can ride in the wintertime and took his family and, and rode the Gold Rush snowmobile trail and did a whole blogging experience for it. So, you know, I think, you know, what I wasn't looking for is to try and do a study to identify more projects, because I think we know what they are and where they are. It would be identifying the resources to be able to have somebody just dive into them. You know, the, the North Caribou Trails Coordinator, Ian, has been a perfect example. We knew that Wonderland was there. We knew that those Dragon Mountain trails were there. What they needed was somebody to own it for somebody to go in and say, this trail needs to be cleaned up. It needs to meet standards. It needs a maintenance arrangement. It needs partnerships. It needs proper signage. It needs better parking. It needs an access road that you could drive with a two wheel drive. Like that's what I meant by, I was learning, wasn't gonna try and I, I didn't want it to do a study to find more projects. I wanted to find those ones and hit them. And those and are the ones that I've listed here. With that, I can totally agree around the feasibility study stuff. You can study these things to death and spend more than $200,000 in, in a course like that. So I can agree with you on that point. Thanks, Darren. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Okay, I have Councillor Elliott, and then I'll make a couple of comments and we'll close this off. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And Darren, thank you very much for the report. It's quite extensive. It covers uh, off any questions that I would have had. Um, we do have tremendous momentum here in our in our region right now. So I do feel that we need to backstop that more. We need to keep moving forward. So I'll be looking forward to uh, the staff. Thank you. So thanks, Darren. Just a, a couple of things, and, and I too, as Council has indicated, I, I think the regional district, and you've articulated it well, needs to be able to be a participant. Uh, and in many cases, the reason that we're able to advance trails uh, through the municipal, mu municipalities, we have taxation authority and we can put our skin in the game, whether it's 20% or whatever the case may be. The, a couple of clarification questions. 
with respect to this kind of function, if a municipality comes in, can the, the because it says CRD tax function, it's not a municipal tax function, can you foresee a circumstance where the money would end up being spent back in the municipality? I do. I do. I think they would be unique assets that are of a regional nature. Like, and I think it, it's almost like how, again, sub-regional rec, North Caribou sub-regional rec is a good example, where we've identified things like, like Laborde Park, like West Fraser Timber Park, the River Valley Trail. Those assets obviously benefit, they're not neighborhood parks. So I think it would be a similar exercise where, is there an asset within the municipality that is is legitimately a part of a regional network? It's a part of a regional interest, then I think it absolutely would be. Okay. Um, that I think those dollars make sense to be a part of this regional budget. Okay. The other piece is that as I read the report, uh, to Councillor Rudenberg's point, you know, I, I think what's missing is the idea of a master plan. That's what's made us so successful is we have a North Caribou Trails master plan that we then pull projects from and we know where we want to go. We know what we want to achieve. Uh, is there a possibility of taking a look at, you know, three sub-regional plans that you then roll up to the regional plan? And is there a possibility of looking at um, coordinating this at the sub-regional levels uh, as opposed to another staff person down in Williams Lake? Because that's often a problem for us in the north. It's a problem I know. It's one of the other issues in Hunter Maw House is that this you know staff position is positioned in Williams Lake and could be sucked into a very large geographic area with very large trail opportunities. So is there an opportunity at the board dialogue to say, yeah, we like this, but we would sooner resource it sub-regionally than a single regional resource? Potentially, um, I think the one of our so to the first point about, you know, and I think carrying on from Councillor Rudenberg's points about a plan. That's what I envision. And it's the way the regional district operates is we create business plans every year. So that's our you're used to seeing them when they come forward through to finance committee, the North Caribou rec one again, you're very familiar with that is the first task of this person because that's the challenge of, of me trying to do this off the side of my desk or whoever is we need a person their first job is to create a business plan and have that go forward to the board and have those priorities identified the idea of connections to sub-regional information through the joint committees i don't think is unreasonable i think a lot of the trail you know the trail knowledge and trail understanding comes through the joint committees so I think they they are legitimately a part of that process, but that planning exercise happens every year. We do it every year. So I think that's what I've tried to lay out some of the framework here, but I think that's really what the first task is for this person is go out there, find these first trails. What are you going to work on first? What's your, what's your first priority and how does that fit within the mandate and the regional picture that we're working on? I, I think one of our challenges to doing it sub-regionally is it's the reverse for the regional district to try and manage we're not managing three regional districts we're managing one regional district and when we keep carving it up into sub-region that makes it administratively difficult for us so that that becomes uh we lose those efficiencies of cooperation between the areas the knowledge we gain across areas so it, it it's a challenge for us to work in sub-regions as opposed to regionally. I completely understand and respect the position of municipalities who see the world a little more sub-regionally than regionally. For us, it, it is the opposite. And that's one of those challenges we do have is uh, the most successful we've been has been where we've created things bigger. Um, you know, the, the most recent new function we've created is the, the Central Caribou Arts and Culture function. The initial proposal for that was mirroring recreation. It was going to be just the greater Williams Lake area. And, and we went further than that. We created it for all of areas D, E, and F, all the way out to small communities like Likely and Horsefly, and et cetera. So we, we stretched where that boundary was, and it has paid nothing but dividends ever since because there's not a line there that says you can do this on this side and that on that side in different jurisdictions. So by removing as many lines as possible, that's where we've had the most success operating on a regional scale. Thank you, Darren. Just a couple of other quick ones. Yep, uh, sure. With respect to the municipality, if we, if all three municipalities opted out, you can still have this function. It would just be an electoral area function. Is that correct? It is correct, yep. Four municipalities. Yeah. We're still gonna give Wells, Wells a kick yeah, at sorry, it. Yeah, sorry, Wells. <laughs> 
I always apologize to Gabe when I don't use it. No, so four. do I. So <laughs> I yeah, think we all do it at times. Um, so uh, you know, I think that yeah, that's something that we need to consider because uh, that tax function, um, being a regional district tax function, if we wanted to add that tax to our residents, we can also do that directly. That's a, one of the differences between us and the regional district. Uh, with respect to the kind of the boat launch conundrum, and uh, that's been one of those things that has gone around the table at the regional district. But I have to say right now in our area, you know, we're, we're kind of, tapped out on for the next couple of years around our capacity to develop the trail systems and networks that we're funded for, notwithstanding looking at those connection opportunities, those destination trail opportunities, but where we really need some assistance is on the boat launch front. And I think we need to give some consideration to advising on that. You go up to Dragon Lake right now, it is in possible uh, to get in there and and uh, you know I take it that it's a Modi function and all of the issues around provincial downloading but at the end of the day it's our residents jointly that are ill served uh, by the disrepair uh, that that's in so I think I would like to at, again coming back to the RD board to have the conversation at the RD board about potentially identifying some priority areas that that whole boat launch beach access on some of those lakes needs to take a priority it's something that i think we need to give some advice to the board on uh, and and my final uh piece uh you know i think my question i guess director norburn or to you darren what is the current budget line item for the coordination function we currently have in north caribou rec uh for trails we what have, have we got 30 35 000. yeah is it 35 or 25 jeff it's kind of off the top of my head. I'm going to say 35, but we'd have I, I to think, check that. I think, I think it is 30. I think it's 35, and then there's a budget of 50,000 for projects. Yeah, so for the actual, so project. Ian's contract is up to 35, and then 50 towards yeah. specific projects. So I think from a council perspective, one of the things we need to think about in terms of giving advice to the board through whoever, myself or director or um, councillor Rudenberg, who's my alternate director, uh, is again, notwithstanding Darren's comments, we get a lot of bang for our buck for 35K uh, out of Ian. He knows the players, he knows how to get things done, he knows the cycling club, he knows where the priorities are, et cetera. I would really be concerned about the intimacy of that knowledge being lost by going to a full regional function. So when the staff brings a report back, I think we need to have a dialogue about, you know, yay or nay, we would like to come into this, but I think we can also influence the dialogue at the board table as well with some of our experiences too. So, uh, and that would be done, as I said, through myself or, or Councillor Rudenberg. Any further questions for Darren? I think Ian would do a fantastic job across the whole region, even actually. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you'd have to talk to his wife. He's now full time <laughs> ambulance attendant, so I think she likes the benefits there too. But anyway, uh, having said that, uh, we'll close this off there. And thank you for joining us. Thanks for your time, uh, and guys. And hopefully the roads get cool enough for you to get back on your motorcycle soon. Excellent. Cheers. Bye. Okay, moving on with our agenda and moving into committee reports. Uh, Councillor Elliott with our finance committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is a report from the June 22nd FSAC meeting. Uh, just a couple of things that we touched on. Uh, the COVID-19 nonprofit uh, impacts to some of the community members. FSAC received a report from the Economic Development Manager, Reed, outlining the work done concerning COVID-19 and the impacts felt by our nonprofit organizations, or NPOs. This report was requested by Council at the March 23rd Council meeting. A survey concerning the MPOs was done through the City's Facebook page as well as being emailed to any with available addresses. Three rounds of phone calls were also made to encourage as many as possible to complete the survey. It was actually quite a challenge to get in touch with all of them as some didn't have email addresses or any kind of information at all. Uh, 31 MPOs completed the survey. 24 experienced revenue loss due to fundraising events being missed due to COVID. The average reported loss was around $17,000. Um, that's 2020 uh, compared to uh, 2019. 18 experienced a loss of revenue due to a decline of membership or program regist uh, registrations. That average loss was about 18,000. 
11 reported lost revenue due to lack of in-kind or cash donations and other issues. That average loss was about 9,000. And 21 NPOs had not applied for any COVID relief funding, and 42% were unaware of any programs being available. Other COVID-19 challenges included difficulty finding meeting space, Groups that perform have been un unable to do so. Practicing has been taking place outside or not at all during the winter. Loss of momentum. There's been a lot of loss of volunteers with recruiting new volunteers being a challenge. This has always been a situation here, but it's just been exasperated with COVID. Uh, limited communication and connection with the community. Mental health concerns have been great with the members and or clients. On the flip side, though, some organizations have adapted very well or shared positive experiences such as adapting to virtual program delivery or discovering community resources during COVID-19. Um, we were about to discuss the fuel management uh, trail outhouse, but we tabled that as we're going to get more, some more information from um, staff. Yeah, and actually, because this preceded the last council meeting, we, we brought it to, straight to council, made the decision at council. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's going to be corrected. Yeah, so we approved the trail yeah. outhouse, the council meeting before that meeting, but we discussed maintenance, and ongoing snow clearing, right. and all that Sorry. sort of stuff. Yeah. It's all good. Uh, we discussed property taxes, and the property taxes have been steadily coming in. People are starting to learn the new homeowner grant process through the province, which has been a change. Um, there are some challenges with the footbridge lighting, um, and there are repairs needed to the whole system, and this will be coming back to Council with uh, some kind of a report. Permissive tax exemptions, the list of exemptions will come to Council in September. There's only new one new request, and that was coming from the Sprout Kitchen. Uh, this report is just for information only, as there are no recommendations coming forward, Mr. Mayor. Any questions or comments for the Chair of Finance on the report? Councillor Vick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Regarding the COVID-19 nonprofit impacts, thank you for the work done on this. I know it was a huge effort. I'm wondering, is the result of like this information, is this still going to come to, I believe there was a recommendation a month ago that was going to come to executive for discussion, or does, does this constitute that? What's the status after this presentation? Yeah, and I guess I'm open city manager. So this this is relative to the provincial COVID grant we received and the partitioning of $100,000 for vulnerable populations uh, in of that provincial money. And the report was triggered by the request to give direct funding to Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, so I, th I think the you know, the question is begged at the Finance Committee based on the staff report. Um, there, there wasn't anything from the staff report or the staff interaction with the not-for-profits that they were actually asking uh, for cash uh, from the city. And the fact that a whole bunch of them hadn't even made themselves aware, aware of grants that existed. So what's the will of council? Refer it to uh, executive to then come back and say, what do we want to do with the rest of the money we have assigned or what? Councillor Elliott? Well, I, I didn't think that uh, FSAC had uh, even discussed bringing it to uh, bringing it forward at all. So, I mean, all the information is there. The will of council is. Yeah, again, it's what's the will of council. So in, an, in the normal course of events, the COVID grant money will come back to finance in our next budget cycle. And that's where we would have the dialogue of any of the residual funds. Because again, Director Bolton, I think it's 2024, is it, that we have to expend those dollars? Remind me of that end date from the province. Yeah, yeah, it's something like that. But at this point, we've only got about 149,000 unallocated. And then a few areas, such as the 100,000 for vulnerable people that we still need to spend the full amount. Yeah, so that dialogue would occur in our next budget cycle on the residual funds. So that might be the time to make uh the uh, discussion if you're comfortable with that okay so we'll make sure it's a, a discrete agenda item on our budget preliminary budget conversation and make sure council is aware of that agenda item okay thank you uh next item is a policy and bylaw report councillor runge 
Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. So this report is to, con to inform Council of what was discussed at the last Policy and Bylaw Committee meeting held on June 17th, 2021. So the first uh, summary was our, we reviewed our PAPCOM action list and we combined items number one and two as a blended review of council documents and procedures. Uh, those being uh, council uh, procedure bylaw, committee policy, code of conduct, meeting norms, conflict of interest. Uh, and really the reason is to ensure future council norms and council candidate packages are relevant and up to date uh, for future use. Uh, our recommendation, I guess it's not a recommendation, we're gonna be revisiting it in the fall and we hope uh, when it comes that if you're, you're more than welcome to attend any other council member here. Uh, the second one is waiving fees for city projects. Uh, so PAPCOM discussed uh, the development of a policy for waiving fees for city projects uh, to ensure that all city departments are clear and consistent on processes and responsibilities. Uh, so so uh, the committee agreed that staff should draft a fee waiving policy, bring it back to, back to PABCOM at a later date, and so that we can be consistent all, all across the board. Our third uh, topic was half massing of city flags for mourning, uh, CCR 14. Uh, so council discussed the half massing of city flags for mourning. Uh, noting that some of our processes did not align with many of the changes that had occurred, uh, you know, at and two flagpoles over the uh, past years. And once again, we agreed uh, for more actions for staff, sorry, uh, to create a process for flag uh, flags flown for all other nations, uh, to create an inventory of a uh, list of flags flown throughout the city, including their locations and to review and report back to what other municipalities procedures are regarding uh, half masting. There are no recommendations and our next meeting will be in September. Great, thank you. And, and just for council's edification on the half masting, um, part of the changes, of course, all of our visitor center flags have up to this point been ceremonial flags because we didn't have the capacity to raise or lower them. Once they were up, they were up, or you had to take a high up in there and go in and remove them and change them. Now they have the capacity to be raised and lowered. So that, so the inventory of all of our flagpoles uh, needs to include that capacity. The second piece is, and I think it's an important one, that, that now we're flying other nations' flags, uh, and in particular, First Nation flags. So uh, half masting procedures are often associated with relative to the crown or relative to uh, things that you know, First Nations may be in dialogue with or dispute around. So we need to work with them now that we're flying their flag. Uh, and I think we'll probably see the Southern Dekel flag go up at some point once they're more formalized. We need to have that relationship uh, with them. Uh, most of our uh, requests cover the BC flag, the city flag and Canada flag, but we have to have a process for working with our First Nations partners with their flags, okay? Any questions or comments on the report? Seeing none, thank you, Councillor Runge. Okay, moving on then to staff reports. Uh, and Director Turner, prior to uh, taking us through this report, we do have uh, the uh, approved new staff position in your department. Uh, that person's uh, in the room, and I think it would be worthwhile doing a brief introduction. Thank you, Mayor. What a great idea. So I'd like to introduce everyone to Melissa Pritchard, who is our new city planner. Um, she started with us a few weeks ago and is well underway and taking lead on our public hearing tonight. And uh, we're very excited for her to be coming back to you guys very soon. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, so the topic of this report is the Hillside Hazard Development Permit for siting of a mobile home or, or mobile homes on Pendergott Avenue. Uh, we are reviewing site designs for the siting of 10 mobile homes on TN vacant Pendergott Avenue lots in the Hillside Hazard area. By way of summary, this development permit is to review the proposed uh, mobile homes. The purpose of the DP is to consider the overall site design in relation to the slope hazard area, as well as the form and character of the mobile homes proposed. The zoning bylaw was adopted in 2019, allows for siting of mobile homes on vacant properties within the West Quinell land land stability area under specified conditions. The proposed plan meets the hillside development permit area guidelines. Um, um, so the 
The aspect that I'd like to point Council to with respect to the proposal is the mobile homes will be designed to have an appearance uh, more resembling a traditional house with a slope roof, horizontal siding, and a minimum of a 24-foot mobile home. Uh, those are the design guidelines that were established in the development permit area, uh, and the, uh, the proposal will meet those subjects. The Recommendation is that Council approve DP 2021-36 for the siting of 10 mobile homes on lots 2, 3, 9, 16, District Lot 1228, Kiribu District Plan PGP 4882 as proposed on the attached plans. Thank you, Director Turner. Now I know we have some individuals in the gallery who wish to speak to this. For Council's edification, uh, uh, during a development permit process, we can make space for the public to speak directly to Council. Uh, but again, it is not an interrogatory. Um, so, and in this case, those in the gallery, it is not a public hearing. Uh, it is just an opportunity for you to state uh, any concerns or mm, support that you have uh, for this. And so I make the mic available. And the same process as last time, uh, simply state your name and address, and then as briefly as possible, uh, what your comments are. Okay, my name is William Benningfield, 761 Donnelly Street. 571 Donnelly Street. I don't even look. Anyways, uh, to start off, the position in the planning development sign for RS1 was placed on Panagrot Street Hill facing Dixon Street, partially obscured by trees, and it wasn't until a dog walker spotted it sometime after it was erected that it was made aware of its existence. Now, I don't have, I don't get the observer. I don't have a smartphone. I don't pay any damn attention to anything. But anyways, I feel this, the location of it was a, you would walk past the thing 30 times and you wouldn't see it. Because I usually cut across the hillsides there and I know those hillsides. Um, I just thought it was put there partially hitting because nobody wanted us to put any input in it. I thought it was a kind of an underhanded way instead of putting the sign on the corner of Dixon. So with respect, this is about the actual development. This is permit, the actual right? development. So if you this could is, speak uh, this to- is my first beef yeah so to anyways, speak to the development itself I, uh, anyways i'll go on to number two okay at the end of pontegard street up the hill right at the very end okay there's the old gravel road that goes up the hillside there's another atv trail that cuts around the right so from the end of pontegard street within 100 meters that ground has dropped about six to eight feet in the last year and a half so you start figuring if that's and the ground is sort of sloping away because I, I walk those trails all the way through up to um, uh, the Diana Mite pit everywhere up there. Um, the ground is sloping away mostly to the north and west. But like I said, it and with all the rains we had last year, it dropped expeditiously, just ridiculous amount. And Putting these things on that type of ground is just insane. You know, uh, it just makes no sense. You're putting, uh, you're talking about putting one on the on the uh, north side of Panagrot, on where all the old foundations are, and all those foundations are all cracked and crumbled up because the ground has moved so much. All you got to do is go over there and look. I mean, the idea looks good on paper, but in practicality, it doesn't look good at all. All the, if somebody wants to come up and have a look, I'll take them up there and show them. I have no issue with that. I'm retired. I'm home 24 seven. Okay. And um, the third thing to allow, we're not, there's the building restrictions on there. The, the people up there, we're not allowed to put in, uh, put in foundations or uh, zone tube type uh, foundations for uh, garages, carports, whatever, and now they're going to do this? It seems to me like you're talking out of both sides of your face. You're gonna allow one thing, but you're not gonna allow the other. Okay, let's keep it respectful. Yeah, but okay. anyways, um, you understand where I'm coming from. You're quite clear. You yes. don't think we should be building or permitting building. No, if area. you're gonna allow one, you gotta allow the other. 
So again, I'll ask the staff to speak to that, but it is taken into consideration in development permit. Thank you. Just for clarification, Mayor, during the same period of which we uh, permitted uh, the mobile homes to occur on vacant lots, we did extend uh, development um, uh, abilities in that area. So maybe you could come to me at a later date. And we, I can share you for, with you the full um, abilities now. There is abilities now for uh, accessory buildings. Okay. We'll let okay. the neighbors know. Um, but anyways, that's my point of view on it. And um, for these reasons, I'm, I'm against it totally. Thank you. Okay, thanks for yeah, your time. Thanks very much. And Director Turner, could you speak to the issue of, of a site inspection of the process? I mean, we've got a reputable builder here proposing this and our own building inspector and his role in this. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is subject to the building inspector inspecting the sites and the lots and determining whether or not this type of construction, and it is the type of construction that's being permitted is 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 uh, being permitted because it is there is recognition that there is some ground movement in the area. That is why we're allowing mobile homes um, because they are uh, able to withstand that movement. And I've spoken with the building inspector, and he feels that the uh, movement that's within that area, um, the, this is the best type of construction. Thank you. Another comment from the gallery? I'm Mary Benningfield, 571 Donnelly Street, Quinnell. Um, attention, uh, Planning and Development Services Department, RE RS-1, Planning and Development Director. I am concerned for the city's plan, RS1, to allow 10 mobile home sites on Panagrot Avenue, an area that has shown to be very unstable. The ground is constantly slipping and dropping year after year. I have been a resident of Donnelly Street and have strolled this area every day for the past 20 plus years and have witnessed the instability firsthand Adding to my concern is the fact that the water pumping station in our area has experienced many failures every year and has resulted in no water to our homes for hours and hours, yet our utility bills keep rising. Again, will, I need you will to stick there to be the an upgrade permit. to the pumping station for our area to compensate for the proposed 10 mobile home sites also will the city of quinnell put restrictions on the age of the above mentioned mobiles will they be restricted to only brand new mobiles and what has the city determined to be the minimum number of mobile homes in an area before the city designates it as a mobile home park thus affecting adjacent single family dwellings property values will the mobiles ho mobiles homes pay their fair share of property taxes as the single family dwellings my concerns are real and founded i strongly urge the city of quinnell to reconsider the rs-1 proposal on panagrot Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's address some of uh, these concerns, Director Turner, with respect to the age of uh, these uh, mobile homes or manufactured homes. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, age is not specified uh, exactly, but the the uh, 24 foot wide mobile homes does make it uh, that they they're mostly going to be new homes, as well as they have to have certain design requirements, as I just mentioned in the report, with the sloping roof, et cetera. The differentiation of how many mobile homes makes a mobile home park and if there's any differentiation on taxation. Thank you. Th these are fee simple lots. This is not a mobile home park. A uh, mobile home park is one lot that has a number of uh, lots within it that are that are rented out. This is not that whatsoever. This, these are fee simple lots. Uh, the people will own the home and own the land. Um, these will be valued by BC assessment just like any other single family home. And they'll pay property taxes accordingly. Exactly. And uh, Director Coben, could you speak to the water uh, query 
uh, or Director Turner with respect to water loading uh, on this? Director Coven? Yes, um, <clears throat> that area of uplands, Dawson, Dixon and Donnelly, it's unique in the fact that it is on a pressurized system due to the height, it, it's not on our gravity system. So it is ran by booster pumps. So as we've upgraded our SCADA system and our control system, along with improved hydro reliability over the last number of years, those power outages are less frequent, but they're, they're somewhat out of our control. As far as the water main breaks go, we do have water breaks throughout the whole entire city at times. And just for clarification on the demand side, is the capacity there to increase the demand relative to this development permit? Yeah, there's already existing plenty existing capacity as well as we have additional fire pumping equipment in that booster station thank you uh, there's other comments no sorry one comment only please okay. thank you you can provide us with another written comment look i'm sorry this is a can we just proceed please yes this is a business meeting of council and we need to keep it that way okay and but you're feel free to if you've got a residual concern to engage with our staff is there another comment no sorry you've already commented yes another commenter okay sorry about the confusion okay seeing none yeah take it on yeah steve forster 520 donnelly <clears throat> directly towards tanya I own several homes in that area. David, it has come to me. Oh, it's I'm not sorry. again an engagement with staff. <clears throat> okay. And my apologies, this is a legal proceeding. No, so I appreciate come that. To me. Um, with owning a few homes in that particular area, I have some concern in terms of property values. I'm also concerned that we have ICON looking at 10 sites and then what happens to the rest of the sites. Because if I do the reading, anything that's going to get developed in the uplands area is going to be strictly uh, trailers or manufactured homes. And I'm, my concern is that is that going to allow 12 wise as well as 24 wise? I know you've made a mandate that the icon developers can be 24 wide, but does that mean the other individual lots are owned by individuals? Can they put a 12 wide on there? Clarification. Thank you. No, we spe have specified in the development permit area for all of the mobile homes that would be permitted on um, individual lots, they have to be 24 foot wide. Okay, because that's a huge concern in terms of uh, typical values of properties. I mean, if you already own several properties in that area, and all of a sudden we get a, a whole slew of uh, double wide units in there, in my experience in other parts of the country, there's going to be some deterioration of value. Okay, noted. Okay. Thank you. And could you do me a favor, just turn that mic off? Okay, so now uh, thank you for joining us tonight and sitting through our meeting to be able to have your uh, opportunity to express your concerns. Council. Uh, on the recommendation and the report. Any comments or questions? Yeah. Councillor Goulet. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And maybe it's a, a question for, because I noticed that there was some issues with uh, um, the cul-de-sac and snow removal. Has that been looked at too? And one of them, it says, snow removal equipment may struggle maneuvering around a cul-de-sac. Have there been any uh, um, issues on that, or has there been anything that we can uh, update on how that would work? And for clarification, just for the public, without a call to sec. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Um, we there. It is identified that snow removal will be more difficult out of there because the call to set was not finished. That development was supposed to um, continue on. Um, as you might know, those lots that were developed um, likely halted uh, during uh, the period where West Quinella and stability issues were just identified. Um, so the uh, the extension of that area has not occurred. The uh, at the end of the lot, it was not meant to be a cul-de-sac. It was meant to continue on and 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 cut over for another development. If you looked at the broader development plans, um, so at that point, at this point, um, the, the, speaking with the uh, director of public works, yeah, it'll be a, it'll be an issue, but not something we couldn't uh, um, handle. Okay, Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you. A question to staff. Uh, Mr. Benningfield has said that. Um, the land, and I'm presuming that he's talking about the land exactly where these 10 mobile homes would be situated. He claims that the 
at least if I'm understanding him correctly, that the land, some of the land in that area has dropped significantly in the last year. Is that of concern? Is First of all, is that true? And is it of concern? I've not been able, I've not gone out and verified or looked at a location where that would be the case, but as per policy, the building inspector has gone out and reviewed the site, uh, in fact, has ruled a few sites unbuildable, has determined that some of the sites that he will not allow building on. Um, so he has determined, um, he has looked at the individual sites and determined they are um, suitable to build in terms of this construction type. Council Paul. And a supplementary question to that, does the, um, the actual development permit uh, provide for any hold harmless for the city in the event of any damage that is um, uh, that that occurs as a result of land movement. The uh, the requirement is to put covenants on the properties. Yes. And just again for clarification, Council Paul, we've had all that dialogue, right? Just so that we're so the public's clear uh, when we change the official community plan and the zone that is now enabling this. And so those kinds of questions we did canvas extensively during that whole process. Councillor Vic and then Councillor Runge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for Director Turner regarding the three potential designs. Um, proposed for these um, mobile homes is is it practical or can we um, recommend that rather than sort of allow the homeowner or the developer to pick this, the design can we articulate that our preference to have a varied um, choice so so it's not a homogenous looking development can we because there's three separate designs they look a little bit different can we can we intimate that perhaps it'd be beneficial to have um, rather than having 10 same homes potentially that we would have a mixture of all three designs that is what they're proposing in fact but they'll be allowing the uh purchaser of the property to select which design they would like is their proposal at this point um so the the probability of them all being one is, is pretty minor, but I think um, the ability to allow, it's just like uh, in terms of at this point, this is not a form and character DP, um, so other than the requirements to uh, make it look more like a, a, uh, a single family home versus versus a modular. Um, the, the, the ability for the uh, anyone else buying a property and putting a home, these go, these are already gonna be limited to three three choices um, versus um, um, building whatever you would want on your, your fee simple lot, right? So we feel like this is a, a good resolve, but the, the, that's why there is three choices because it should result in some mixture. Uh, thank you. Uh, through, through the mayor, a question I guess to, uh, to the director of, uh, Capital Works here, the question there is, it says some restoration work will be required uh, to resolve some of the infrastructure in the area. Do we have some sort of a tentative cost estimate on that to, or would that already be covered in the building permit process? Yeah, no, not, not particularly. We, I have walked the roadway and, and noticed that some of the boulevards have overgrown. We have done periodic minor maintenance um, over the years to, you know, remove some trees that were growing up along street lights and, and whatnot but the water main for for health and safety reasons it was it was it's disconnected near the valve just so it's not a dead end line at this point so that would have to be reconfigured as well as a cleanup of the curb and gutter boulevards and some pavement cracking etc um so that that road's been barricaded off there for quite a number of years so the a corollary to that question is who picks up the costs for that kind of thing to enable this development to occur. Director Turner. Thank you. It would be the city. There's These are fee simple homeowners that uh, it's just like anybody else going and buying a lot and looking to, to build, right? So um, they wouldn't be expected to contribute to infrastructure at that point. 
Go ahead. Uh, so, so I guess then I just need to follow up to my question. Do we have an estimate of that cost then? Like, because there are a lot of, I'm not talking about the trees and stuff. I'm talking about the roads and the water. Like if, if that's 500,000, that's, you know, I'm just, just a it's, question. It, it, we will, we can certainly get that and provide that, but it just as a caution, I wouldn't say that that is a, that is a subject of this, this application. These are, these are fee simple lots that exist, right? So people have the right to purchase them and build unless, uh, unless there's somebody else going to buy them. There have been taxes paid on that property towards our infrastructure maintenance. We have not maintained that infrastructure because it's not developed. Now that it's going to be developed, those ratepayers have a right to see that tidied up, if you will. Okay, so there's a principle there. Okay, any other questions or comments from council? Okay, on the recommendation. Do I have a mover and or seconder on the recommendation? Okay, Councillor uh, Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I wanna thank the individuals that took the time to come down here and, and address council um, on this situation. And I think you've brought up some, some great points, some interesting points, um, like the old foundations and the land slippage and thing, that's, that's exactly where we have a building inspector. And if the building inspector is able to sign off on that, that for me gives, you know, makes me feel good that that we're protected. The lack of water was was uh, mentioned, and that's been addressed. That that is not an issue. Um, that there have been upgrades made. There are you know out power outages all over the city, and that can happen anywhere. Taxation has been addressed. These will be uh, fee simple, so they'll be paying the same taxes as everybody else. And it was an interesting comment about the land values in the area and the possibility of the land values coming down because of modular or mobile homes. But at the same time, we're talking about the challenge of <clears throat> not putting in any buildings because the foundations are all crumbling. Now, in my estimation, I would think that the value of the homes, if we put more homes in there, is going to be greater than just having empty land sitting there. These are going to be single family homes and not trailers as was commented on as well so i think people will be taking pride in their homes they don't look like mobile homes they don't look like trailers i think the designs are good as chair of the housing committee one of the things that we've been looking at is just the lack of housing in the in the city and that's a, a common theme that we hear everywhere people are begging to have places to rent places to live and this is something that we've been working extremely hard on so i thank you for the information but with all the information that we've gathered over the months with the housing committee and where we're going, I would move the recommendation of staff. Seconder for the recommendation. Seconder, Councillor Vic. Further questions or comments on the motion? Uh, Councillor Elliott. Goulet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm just wondering if we have to go with 10 right, it says in part of this report that they're gonna sell two or three right away. Is there an opportunity, do we have to do all 10 or can we look so at this I, as they- I wanna caution council here. We have a developer in our community who's come to us. We can piecemeal them on design, we can piecemeal them on numbers, we can do all of the work of the developer, or we can do what our job is to do, is to say if that developer thinks that building 10 on there, uh, the market's there for it and, and able to do it. When we have such a housing crunch, I don't think we should be getting into nickeling and diming them and saying we're only gonna permit three now and prove it out for later. What do you do with a multi-unit dwelling or a, you know, a gated community or any of those things? So it's not our role to second guess the developer in these things. You have a development permit in front of you, it's either yes to the 10 or it's no to the 10. That's it. That's how this process works. Councillor Paul. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to ditto the comment that was made about the, 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 our trust in the building inspector. He's a professional. And uh, I'll be voting in favor. Um, and I'm thinking that if a mobile home can, um, can survive the cottonwood slide on, um, on Highway 97, it should be able to survive anything that's coming its way up in the uplands area. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Any further questions or comments? Okay, Councillor Runge. Sorry, and just one other point with regards to that, because you know it's it's been okayed by Fortress BC. That was one of my first questions when I first saw this. I was, oh, what are we dealing with with regards to you know safety stuff? And it's it's been okayed all the way down the line. So yeah, uh, you know 
hearing some of the other things, quite, you know, made me question some of the things. But when I look at that with regards to our building inspector, with regards to, I think we have a disconnect with regards to what modular mobile homes look like nowadays. They they do look like homes, uh, you know. They so I, I I think I'll also speak in favor of this. I don't I don't see you know we're we're trying to create a community. We're trying to add add to our uh, building stock. So I think this is actually positive. And I think we'll see it afterwards play out that way too. Okay, any further comments or questions? On the recommendation, all in favor. Opposed? Okay, thank you. Uh, and thank you to staff for that. Okay, next agenda item, uh, community forest application, manager Roberts. Great, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. So this report is being submitted to request assistance from Council to enable the next steps in the community forest application process. A summary of this report, the technical working group met on June 9th and discussed the next steps to move forward in the application process. Um, the five governments, that being Latako Diné, Lacouz Diné, Nazco First Nation and Estela First Nation, as well as the city, needs to seek technical experts and legal counsel to assist with parts of the CFA application. These include, but aren't limited to, area selection analysis, developing management and business plans, creating articles of incorporation, shareholder agreements, policy documents, etc. So as such, interim funding to hire expertise will be required until funds from the non-replaceable forest license or NERFL are in place. Once NERFL funds are realized, the city will be reimbursed for interim expenditures incurred by the collective in relation to the CFA application. Should I go on or should we pause? Okay, do you want me to keep going? Well, in, in, in this case, in this case, I do think it's important that the entire recommendation be read, and then we can have our dialogue about that. So go ahead with that. Okay, thank you. So the city will also require independent advice from business, legal, and financial specialists throughout the CFA application to ensure the municipality is meeting our regulatory requirements and managing risk. As per the participation agreement between the five governments, um, the fees for these types of services are not to be reimbursed through the NERFL and re will require a separate council resolution. As the city will require approval from the inspector of municipalities to incorporate a corporation or acquire shares in a corporation with other governments, a resolution is being sought from council to begin working towards business and governance models between the First Nation governments of that I've actually already previously said for the public record. Shall I move into the recommendations? Okay. So the first, that subject to a memorandum of understanding being duly executed between the city of Quesnel and Latako Diné Nation, council allocates up to $200,000 from the city of Quesnel's tax and community stabilization reserve for non-replaceable forest license funds to cover the interim spending for the community forest agreement application process in advance of the non-replaceable forest license funding with interim spending to be reimbursed when NERFL funding is received. And that mayor and corporate administrator be authorized to execute the memorandum of understanding between the city of Quesnel and Latako Diné Nation as required to complete the agreement and that city council approve spending of $20,000 from council initiatives for independent advice from business, legal, and financial specialists that directly relate to the city of Quesnel's interests throughout the community forest application, application rather process. And that council directs staff to work with legal counsel on pursuing business and governance models between Nazco First Nation, Lacous Diné First Nation, Latako Diné First Nation and Esdala First Nation for the purpose of applying for a community forest agreement and the eventual, eventual governance of the tenure, and that Council directs staff to discuss plans of incorporation or acquiring shares in a corporation for the purpose of the community forest agreement application with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, Governance and Structure Branch with the intention of obtaining support, direction and approval from the Inspector of Municipalities. 
That has to be one of the longest <laughs> meanest recommendations we've seen. Okay, so we have a mover of the recommendation. Councillor Rudenberg, second. Uh, it's open for a comment or a question on the recommendation. Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, at the bottom of page 32 of 81, um, part of the re part of the recommendation is that the city or the council authorizes uh, an expenditure uh, an allocation of up to, no not to of twenty thousand or pardon me yeah twenty thousand dollars, and then if I go over to page thirty three under financial implications, it stated that the proposed project will result in some direct spending from the city. Is that some direct spending from the city, the $20,000 that was earlier referred to? Yeah, and it, it would be an up to. Uh, it's a $20,000 allocation for legal fees associated with our expenses. Okay, thank you. So it, I'm, I'm presuming that that $20,000 is, is, is for the city to do its own due diligence to make sure that its interests are looked after. Because if it wasn't, I was going to be asking why the other four parties to the agreement wouldn't be contributing. But but that twenty thousand dollars is the city's interest. Am I am I correct? Yeah. The current the current agreement we have with all the parties is that they have to cover their own independent legal costs. So they will be covering. We have the combined uh, dollars two thousand. Correct. 2000 apiece from the partners for the collaborative work uh, of the lawyer, but then we have to cover our own independent costs. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Seeing none uh, on the motion, all those in favor? Any opposed? So that that was passed unanimously for uh, the record. Okay. Uh, Councillor Elliott moved it. Councillor Rudenberg seconded. Okay. Next, uh, uh, housing summary. Director Turner. Thank you, Mayor. I'm gonna have a uh, housing planner, um, Anna Franken, come up and deliver this report. Okay, thank you. Um, I just have to wait. You're doing that, Ria? <laughs> okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Mayor, Sorry. Council. Sorry, I'm just gonna stop you for one second. So just from a technological perspective with the two screen, I think it would be good. We don't need it with Anna here. Uh, but we have had presentations where it'd be great if they're zooming in, one screen is for the presenter and one screen for their slides, just for future possibility. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, rather than the little one up top. Okay, let's go ahead because we've got the person in the room. Okay, thank you. Yeah, um, so I've been working um, <clears throat> with city staff with Director Turner uh, as the community housing planner for the last 10 months. So that was through a grant from NDIT. So I'm just here to summarize the work um, that we've done on that. Okay, why isn't it going? Sorry, I usually know how to work PowerPoint. <laughs> Somebody you gotta come and help me. There's just no arrow anywhere on here. Oh, hit enter, gotcha, thank you. Use the mouse. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so the objectives of this position were um, at a high level to respond to um, the need in Quinell. Um, the current housing stock, as we know, is older. It's the majority of it is single family homes, and there's an increasing an increasing housing demand in the community. And so, um, the position was to lead and implement the recommendations identified in the North Caribou Housing Needs Assessment, Gap Analysis, and Action Plan. That was a major part of the work and to develop or revitalize housing units within the North Caribou to meet identified needs, to plan and manage for the changing future market demands for various dwelling structures. Oh. 
Um, so I wanted to start with the outcomes. So uh, I'm going to speak to sort of all of the objectives of the grant, but also the outcomes um, to date. So there's some good stuff going on. The, um, with regard to city properties, an RFP was reissued, uh, was issued twice, and then it had a closing date of May 17th, the second time, and um, staff is continuing right now to work with a proponent to finalize a submission. Um, an RFP was issued for the Dragon Lake property. There were no submissions um, by the deadline, but there is ongoing interest in that property. Um, staff continues to work with BC Housing on housing opportunities in the community, and there is continuing work uh, going on around the Caribou Field. Developments that are actually underway, there's eight units on Reed Street. Um, it's a conversion of commercial space to residential. There's 24 units completed at Meadowood Mobile Park. Uh, yeah. And under uh, planning underway, uh, there's a property at Campus Way that's being considered for multi-unit residential development. There are 34 units um, with the Telecom Society, a five-story housing project beside the Friendship Center. Uh, rezoning is on hold currently until the funding is approved. There's nine single family uh, home lots that have been subdivided on Gook Road. Um, there's a conversion of a number of downtown buildings actually to residential spaces that are um, underway or being considered. There are 10 units on Panagot Street being considered. And um, due to the push to get the um, secondary suites more uh, legalized and, and sort of a higher profile, there's eight new secondary suites in town. So under the NDIT objective, um, basically to understand the current housing situation was the first objective. Um, so there were there were this. Uh, I was working on another grant with the city um, with overlapping objectives. So one of them was to complete a senior housing assessment that was through a UBCM grant. Um, I developed a community bulletin outlining the current demand for all types of housing, including workforce housing, and that was directed to um, developers uh, out of town and locally. We began discussions uh, to establish a homeless serving system map for local players. Um, with regard to the second objective, communications, we updated the website to reflect new housing incentive zones. We posted a series of public messages on social media regarding the accessory dwelling units with links to the website. Um, we engaged the senior community through two public surveys on housing needs. That was uh, through the UBCM grant. Um, we distributed that community housing needs bulletin to interested developers and over 40 landlords in the region in a mail out. Um, just other communication reporting to councillors and committees on the status of um, housing projects. So under the planning function, the actions completed within the um, and for the North Caribou Housing Needs Assessment Gap Analysis and Action Plan. Um, we established a contact list of developers and builders in the region and, and grew that list throughout the, the period of time. We toured uh, housing projects in Prince George and liaised with developers up there and their um, the community planners up there to sort of um, build our capacity here. Um, we developed a working document listing all interested parties and projects related to active projects in the region, and that's an ongoing um, dynamic spreadsheet that is updated regularly as projects move along or if they stop, sometimes they stop. Um, we developed those two RFPs for city-owned properties to develop multi-unit housing. Um, we developed a comprehensive list of city owned and privately owned land parcels, which is used. Uh, we presented that to interested parties for potential development. Um, we met with several out of town developers who were who came to Quinell to tour those potential building sites. Um, we connected with the Decath Community Housing to discuss potential um, for them to act as local housing operations managers for outside developers that expressed that interest to us and that included some senior housing in those conversations. We worked closely with a local investor interested in building multi-unit and submitted a funding application for the city dollars or for the city to the NDIT dollars for door program. <clears throat> that application is currently on hold. We work closely with potential developers interested in the projects on the Dragon Lake and Kinship property to ensure highest and best use. We assisted with review and assessment of housing development proposals um, submitted for the second RFP and then 
uh, uh, we did a parking analysis around City Hall. We researched and communicated with regional groups regarding a potential rent bank for the area and summarized progress in a report. Uh, communicated with the various stakeholders regarding the urgent workforce housing needs here, including we talked with Barkerville Gold Mine, um, the healthcare housing coordinator, Northern Health, and I reached out to West Fraser Mills in School District 28. Um, through the EBCM grant, we developed a rental database for seniors um, that shows accessibility information, rental rates, and services, et cetera, and that was published on the North Caribou Seniors Council website. With regard to funding opportunities, which was another objective within the NDIT grant, um, we presented funding opportunities to potential developers and community groups. Those included the Rapid Housing Initiative, the NDIT Dollars for Door Program, the City Housing Incentives, and then we assisted with applications and letters of support for funding streams to strengthen the development activities with regard to those opportunities. Um, with regard to the last objective, um, collaboration with various orders and institutions of government. I worked um, with the CRD to deploy the senior housing survey as well as the city and um, worked with them to understand the housing needs across the city and the regional district. I reached out to and worked with the Kleskis uh, Nazco First Nation leadership to identify the rapid housing funding opportunity and then um, pre prepared reports for, for council. I think that's it. So that's it. Does anybody do you have questions? <laughs> so questions or comments? Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mrs. Mr. Mayor. It looks like you've been busy. <laughs> it's been I want to thank you very, very much for all the work that you've done. It's okay. it's absolutely exceptional. And after we finish the uh, the needs assessment and gap analysis, we had to keep that momentum going for sure to you know to meet all the challenges and you've done a great job well, and I, I really appreciate it um there's still a lot of work to do you know we have to keep that momentum going so i guess my question to director turner is where do you feel that we're going now um as far as staffing levels or i mean you've got a lot on your plate where do you see us thank you uh councillor elliott uh, and again i echo those uh thanks to uh to um, Anna, the, the the amount of activity we've had in the last uh, few, uh, well, in the last year, over year, maybe two year and a half, um, in terms of individuals, in terms of the housing uh, market, really across the board, and it affected us here too. The no, the amount of inquiries that have been going on and people searching for opportunities in housing has been huge, and it's not stopped. They, they, we there uh, all a lot of those, and I know Anna's just itching because there's a whole bunch of things that I mean we're working with developers. There there are people that are working on projects. Unfortunately, we can't reveal those that we're not allowed to. Um, but there's there are proponents working on projects and uh, having Anna uh, there to really, you know, be the person to keep them going. It was it was extremely helpful and we're hoping and 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 I know Anna was saying uh, to a number of them all, well, you better get that done. <laughs> before. So so hopefully by, you know, Monday, you'll see some stuff. OK, other questions or comments? Councillor Runge. Thank you, Anna. Uh, great report. I, I, my question is, uh, you know, is there anything that we're missing here, uh, like that council is possibly missing that still can support you guys to make life easier and, you know, get some, you know, get the projects, you know, sprouting, sprouting, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I hate to see something like we've got some here that have been started and they're covered up with plastic and not finished. You know, I'm not sure, you know, the one just across from the park. Um, Se and that's totally separate that but you know the, you know is there something that possibly that you know that we're missing here that you guys are hearing from developers are saying hey this might make it easier <laughs> i don't uh, i'll let you speak to that tim i think and by all means just jump in on it because you've had lots of discussions with developers as well but uh one of the the uh, uh our, our conversations with developers are we're this close. I mean, um, uh, the work that's happened in other communities and around housing in terms of in terms of um, uh, putting all the work that we have done over the last little while and actually getting projects on the ground is um, 
is substantial. And, and, and talking to my colleagues in other communities, they said, Tanya, this didn't happen overnight. This, this took time and you, there's a lot of relations, there's a lot of uh, um, work that needs to be done. Um, there is work happening on properties right now to determine housing projects. Um, and um, uh, right now we have the incentives in place for them. Uh, we have um, we have a, a number of, of, of avenues for them to take in terms of uh, connections with different agencies, in terms of financing, et cetera. Um, it's just putting, and I'm speaking about market housing specifically here. It's just about them putting those last pieces of the uh, of the of the uh, their uh, their return on investments yeah. together, and that's really what it is. I, th there's really nothing else I can say about that. I, is there anything else you want to add to that? Anna? No, I think that's exactly it. I think the numbers in Quinell right now, it's, it's, you know, it's not easy to say I'm going to build a million dollar building, but I think people are seeing the interest. They're, they're, they see the buzz here, they know things are happening, and they're very interested in getting in. They're just gotta figure the financial piece out. And I have Councillor Rimbird next, but go yeah, ahead, I, Councillor. I just want to say thank you. And it was really like, you know, if there was something that we were missing and just, yeah. it popped up here, that was great, yeah. thank you. So there is one There is one more. Okay, go ahead, Director Turner. The one thing I will add to that is there is a few things happening economically around here that are those last few pieces, is in my estimation, that will, that will make those last pieces come together and make those decisions for those developers. And we just got to keep communicating yeah. those to them. So I think there's there's two key points though, and it's embedded in what you're saying. One is the rapidity of the ROI relative to other markets. We just are not we're going to return yeah. uh, on investment, but not on the short time frame that a lot of these investors are used to. And I think that's what they're kind of settling into is if I'm in for a bit of the longer game, I am going to get it back, and therefore it's worth putting that upfront money. The other though that we haven't mentioned is some of our properties that are prime development properties don't have infrastructure. So when you add that infrastructure, that upfront infrastructure cost that whittles away the ROI, it makes it an even longer game. And that's something that we've talked about, uh, you know, that we may have to come back and take a look at. And I was on a conference call with the Minister of Housing and the Minister of uh, Municipal Affairs, and there were actually a number of communities that pointed that out, that we may need a specific um, infrastructure program to enable us to get developable lots ready. Uh, the, and, and so that's mm -hmm. one way that that could be addressed is come out and say, okay, municipalities that can prove they have a housing need, that they've got land that can meet that need, but it doesn't have infrastructure. There's 60 cents on the dollar, there's 70 cents on the dollar or whatever made available to address that issue. So I would say that that's the one piece that wasn't mentioned by staff. Uh, Councilor Rudenberg. Thank you. And thank you for your report. Um, I was going to make the comment. And so what do you do in your spare time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when you when you talk about um, senior housing, you talk about some of our First Nations piece, when you talk about developers, those are all pieces that people always keep saying. So what are you doing about that? And, you know, with the work that you've done here, you've laid that groundwork. And even though it may not be that immediate, you know, building happening, you've laid the groundwork. And I think that it's going to pay major dividends either shortly or in the very near future. So um, job well done with you and, and all of the partners that you've worked with. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from Council? Council Vic? I just wanted to thank you, Anna, for the great work and uh, sort of been a long journey. We started with seniors, ended up with housing. I think it's fantastic. So this is like phase one of your report. When's the phase two coming out? <laughs> <laughs> well, Fred is retiring tomorrow, so. We're, we're done. I was just going to say, she now has a husband who's freed up to go play with, so. <laughs> but I, I do want to say I've really, really enjoyed working with all of you and um, staff, you, Councillor Vic Rio with the senior stuff and, and Director Turner. It's really been a pleasure. I've enjoyed it. So thank you, Anna. You do quality work and it's been a privilege to have you working uh, with us on this project. So right, thanks very well, much. Thanks very much. Uh, next item, strategic communications, Director Bolden. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the purpose of this report is to request more funding for the city's strategic communication project from the COVID Safe Restart Grant and also support a grant application that may cover some of these costs. And it's also just to discuss a celebration event that we're planning for mid-September to for all of us to get out of COVID and go celebrate all the projects that the city has completed. 
So of course, one of council's strategic objectives was to enhance community engagement. So we started this project and council originally approved 50,000 from the COVID Safe Restart Grant for Strategic Communications. Those funds were used to hire a consulting company, consulting company to do a review of the city's communication process, which is currently underway. Right now, the community survey is out there gaining input and it actually closes tomorrow. So, and they're providing support in implementing the recommendations that will come out of the review. As part of this project, staff is currently reviewing options for public engagement software that would be used to get the public's input on a variety of city initiatives. Staff is currently reviewing several options and is likely that the software will cost approximately 20,000 for the first year and then 10 to 15,000 to 15, in fees for future years. There's currently a grant program available through the Canada Healthy Communities Initiative Program that may cover some of the, these first year costs. In addition, funds will be required to create assets such as videos, communication materials, et cetera, that will be used throughout this process. The intent would also be to purchase some tablets for this project that would be used at events or the front desk at City Hall for people to be able to use the public engagement software. The city is currently starting to plan a celebration event that will likely be held on September 18th to celebrate all the things that we've been unable to show the public due to COVID. The city could use the funds allocated for Billy Barker Days this year for this event. The hope is that the city can move quickly on implementing the engagement software and be ready to launch it at the planned celebration event and have people sign up at the event. So the recommendations are, <coughs> sorry, the council approves up to an additional 50,000 from the COVID Safe Restart Grant for the Strategic Communications Project. The council approves a reallocation of up to 30,000 from the Billy Barker Days to the celebration event planned for September. And the council supports the application to the Canada Healthy Communities Initiative Program for the Community Engagement Platform Project. And if we did get that grant, that would be reimbursed to the COVID Safe Restart Grant Funds. Okay, Councillor Rudenberg, moving the recommendation. Seconder for the recommendation. Councillor Vick, questions or comments? Councillor Runge. Is you up or no? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I think this is a, a great idea. I, I think it's a long time in coming. I, I do want to re maybe request is the wrong word, but I, I do I do want us to think about usage with you know if we're looking at those costs, the uh, maintenance costs, and and that we have some sort of a trackable uh, tracking of that so that we can, going forward we see if it's actually you know, if we're getting bang for our buck, I guess, at the end of the day, so that so that we pre do that. So we are right. So when we ask or someone asks in the future, we have those numbers. Thank you. Absolutely. The software includes usage tracking. So we'll be able to see how many people are engaging with us. Okay, Councillor Paul and then Councillor Vic. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear. I'm I'm speaking mainly to the to the audience there that the $30,000 is not replacing any grant that goes to Billy Barker days, but it's for things like barricades and and uh, detours and garbage removal and that kind of thing. So basically, we would just be transferring that money over to another event. That's correct, Councillor Paul. Councillor Vic. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Director Bolton, for the software um, being considered, is it the bang the table software is that we are looking at three options bang the okay. table is one of them for sure so if they're if they're of a similar kind um having done a little research on those software um architectures we were struggling for a great way to activate our community and, and encourage a different kind of engagement and they're all they're really excellent and i think we'll get a lot of value out of that and a lot of great ways to track that engagement so i think it's I think it's excellent. And at our communications meeting today, we did have a conversation of looking for some immediate um, projects, initiatives, et cetera, that we can populate whatever the software is so that when we do the kickoff event for that in conjunction with our celebration event, we're actually immediately seeking feedback on some of our key initiatives. So we want to populate. We don't want to just say we're moving in that direction. We actually want to populate it and begin the, the dialogue. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, on the recommendation, all those in favor? All those opposed? That motion passed unanimously. Thank you, Director Bolton, and to Director Colbin. Now, before I ask Director Colbin to speak to his report, I, I wanna make a clarification comment for council. Uh, this is an information only report for Council. 
the implications of, because we wanted to get it into the public domain the data we've been talking to people that the data sets coming the data sets coming this is the data set we will be scheduling a conversation a strategic conversation about what do we do with this data set what does it tell us about the west quinell land stability project what does it tell us about ongoing maintenance of that etc in uh, September, I think, is what we're aiming for. So in order to honor, you know, that process and the fact that, you know, we've got another meeting tonight, this this discussion with Director Coben is just about the data set. If you've got questions about the data set or how to read the data set, et cetera, uh, then that's really what this is about. The main conversation, of, okay, so what does it tell us? What do we need to do? Where do we need to go? We're going to book a meeting where we'll have the luxury of time to dig in on that okay so just so you're clear uh director colvin yes this is device council the 2020 west cornell land spillage annual report has been received and to make it available to the public um, it describes the infrastructure contains the monitoring data results for 2020 and provides a, an update to the observed trends and changes since the previous monitoring report um, staff is in consultation with the qualified professionals, wood environment and infrastructure, who's prepared this report uh, following its recent receipt back on June 10th, and we'll bring back further updated information to council at a later date. Thank you. So council's had an opportunity to look at the data. Are there questions for Director Colbin just on the data set or clarifications about uh, what you're seeing in the data set itself so that you understand it well? City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I do think it's important, while this is just very much a laying this report down on the table, I think it's important that for the public record, we do state that the land movement in 2020, which this report refers to, was a very large amount of land movement relative to the, in particular, um, what our current history has been and where that current or the recent history of the last few years has shown declines in every year and some low numbers. Uh, last year, the movement was 84 millimeters, which is the highest movement that we're showing on our record since 2005. And the report attributes that to primarily weather conditions. So I think it's important that it's out there and for councils knowledge and of course we ironically we talked about it earlier tonight um, when we discussed it with Panagrad Street we do have uh, regulations in place to allow the safe continuance of business at the discretion of the building inspector who's qualified to make judgments so there is no urgent need for a change to regulation to reflect these higher numbers, but it's important that it's out in the community that those numbers are high and that people need to be aware of it. And that's why we're tabling this report early so the public can pick up a copy. And there are interested people who have been following this quite closely over the years. And so they get that chance to, to pick up that copy and really see that. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. And, and again, for clarification, clarification, in our strategic plan, we have a twofold piece. One, we'll have a conversation about what it means for us, but we've also committed to go over uh, to West Quinell and have a community uh, conversation as well. So, okay. Any questions or comments on the report? Uh, it's for information and uh, in September, we'll have our dialogue. Okay, thank you, Director Coleman. Okay, next, uh, we have no SIP, so correspondence, uh, the Johnson Avenue speed reduction measures request. You have correspondence uh, from uh, the Johnson neighborhood relative to uh, the decision of council previously not to install speed bumps or to reduce speed on that road. Uh, this has already been received, but because because of the agenda package, but because it is a petition and a, and a kind of a counterpoint to a decision council made, it's really the will of council what you want to do with it. Councillor. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, I'd move receipt. So it's already received, that's what I was saying. It's, it's already Thank received. You. So uh, unless council wants to do anything else with it, we'll move on to the next agenda item. Okay. 
then the next uh, piece of correspondence is just to make everybody aware uh, that uh, we're in a changing dynamic as we experience the night. We now have people back in our gallery. Uh, we have the opportunity now to do blended public hearings uh, and blended engagement uh, with our community. So that's a, a bit of a bonus uh, from COVID. So uh, because this impacts municipal operations and went to our chief administration uh, administrative officers, uh, we thought it was important to put it there for council's edification too uh, as we evolve. And I'm going to ask Director Bolton because we're now got an emerging situation vis-a-vis -vis masks because we've been trying to sort out what our obligations are around masks and Director Bolton if you just speak to that. Sure we're working on the memo to our staff right now we'll be following Dr. Henry's advice that everyone is recommended to wear masks until they've had their both their vaccines but it will be a recommendation versus mandatory. Yeah so we're moving from that mandatory situation into the recommended situation okay so I think we'll be in a blended situation for a little while okay. Uh, next, uh, bylaws, bylaw 1893, City of Cornell Master Zoning Amendment, third reading. So that's the first bylaw that we had on our um, public hearing tonight. Uh, Councillor Elliott, so moved. Councillor Runge, second. Any further questions or comments on the master zoning? Seeing none, all those in favor. Okay, any opposed? That motion is passed unanimously. With respect to bylaw 1894, City of Quinnell Official Community Plan Amendment uh, with regard to Webster Avenue, third reading. Mover and seconder. Councillor Elliott, so move, seconder. Councillor Vic, okay. any further questions or comments? On the motion, all those in favor? Any opposed? That motion is passed unanimously. And with respect to uh, bylaw 1895, City of Cornell Zoning Amendment, Webster Avenue, third reading. Motion? Mm -hmm. Councillor Ellick, Councillor Vic, any further questions or comments? All those in favor? Opposed? That motion has passed unanimously. Okay, uh, and no changes to upcoming meeting schedule, uh, changes to committee appointments, announcement, future events. The heat wave will end, that's my announcement, at some point in the near future. Okay, uh, gallery questions. Okay, seeing none, then I would ask for a motion to adjourn our regular meeting and then reconvene in our in-camera. So motion to adjourn. Councillor Goulet, so moved. Councillor Runge, second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Okay, and we'll take a five-minute recess uh, in order to, for people to move around a bit and then we'll reconvene. <laughs>